Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Father, your word never returns void without accomplishing your purposes. Father, we thank you for who you are in giving us all these wonderful encouragements and instructions and guidances and examples so that we can learn more about you and so that we can be focused on you. It's so easy to run our lives with you as, as just one of the many things that, that sits in a keychain. You know, here's my lock to God, and here's my lock to my house, and here's my lock to my office. And, you know, we've got all these things going on, and you just are kind of one of them until we get to know you and we study your word, and then you become the whole thing. And everything that we do revolves around relationship with you first. Speak to us today as we read your word, as we understand what Paul was trying to tell us so that we can draw closer to you, we can know you better. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in Philippians chapter 3. As we've been studying this book, we've determined that the theme of the book is Rejoice in the Lord Always. And there's actually several themes you could use because it's so much about getting to know Christ that we could have that as a topic. Uh, But we chose uh, Philippians 4.4, Rejoice in the Lord Always, because the whole book The number one key word is some form of joy or rejoicing in the midst of persecution. How many of you, by the way, have found yourself going through some persecutions that you've been studying Philippians? Because usually there will be some things like that that come up when you're learning something. You will have the opportunity to go through persecution. Well, last week we spent a lot of time talking about where is your confidence? And there's a chart out there if you really want to dig into the discussions we have. But I want to review it because the whole of chapter 3 follows in sequence. So I want you to see the sequence of what Paul is telling us. In chapter 3, Paul basically, starting in verse uh, 5, well, starting in verse 3, talks about putting confidence in the flesh. And when he did, his confidence in the flesh, this is his past life. What did he talk about? Yeah, positions and achievements. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is found in the law, found blameless. So he was touting all of his past accomplishments. And we used uh, St. Francis of Assisi as an example of that because he had past accomplishments. He came from a a prestigious family, a wealthy family at that time, uh, about the 12th century A.D. He had all this background, this pedigree, and yet he gave it up. This is what happened with Paul. There, There wasn't a better Jew than Paul. He was so good that he was persecuting the church because he saw it as flawed, as blasphemy. That was his past. But then, what happened? He he found Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, we learn the story about not just finding Jesus, but finding Jesus miraculously. What did Jesus do to bring Paul to himself in Acts chapter 9? He blinded him. As he's riding to Damascus to to uh, actually to persecute the church in Damascus, He's on his horse, and all of a sudden this blinding light comes and literally blinds him. Not the guys with him. He falls off his horse, and the guys with him see the light, but they don't hear Jesus' words. Paul does, and Paul's blinded, taken into Damascus, and it's there then that his, he's able to see, and at some point along the line, he has received Christ. He has committed his life to Christ. Uh, by the way, you have to read the whole book of Acts to understand his whole conversion because there's lots of other tidbits thrown in later in Acts that talk about things that happened on that conversion day. When God chose to convert Paul, what difference did that make in his life? (laughs) Everything. He went from focusing on the past, from being the prestigious Jew of persecuting the church in zeal in what he believed was righteousness, And he moved on. 
He moved to a different place. He moved to the place where it tells us in verse 8 of Philippians 3, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now that's important because a lot of people know Jesus. They know the historic Jesus. But Christ is Messiah. Jesus is his name. And Lord means that we recognize him as God. So we're not just saying, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I mean, the Jews believe in Jesus. The demons believe in him, and they shudder. But Christ Jesus, our Lord, indicates who he really is. Our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our King, our God. So Paul, it says here, he counted all things as loss. And he set some goals that he has, which is his present. These are present tense goals that he laid out here that we went through in verse 8. His first one is that I may gain Christ. I may have that position of Christ in my life instead of the position I used to have. That's what I want. I want to gain Christ. And then he says in verse 9 that I may be found in him. What does it mean to be found in him? Okay, so she says to be found in Christ is to let the light of Christ shine through you so that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's Matthew 5, 16. And she said, uh, Acts chapter 4, where the people recognized that the disciples had been with Jesus. They, were, they found Jesus. They knew Jesus. They were, he was part of them. He, through the Holy Spirit, lived inside of them. Then he goes on in verse 10 saying that I may know him. So first I want to gain Christ, I want to be found in him, but I want to know him. I've been married a long time, and my husband will say to me sometimes, how did you know that about me? Or how did you know I was going to say that? Or how did you know I was going to do that? Because I've made it my life's goal to know him, really understand him so that I can be a helpmate to him. That's what this means to know Christ. The Greek word is gnosko, which means experientially knowing Jesus Christ. Not just with our heads. I mean, we can know him. We know who he is. As I said, the Jews know who he is. The Muslims know who he is. Historians know who he is. But that doesn't mean they have an experiential relationship with him, does it? So Paul's goal was not just to know him mentally, but to experience life with Jesus to really know him inside and out. And then once he knew Jesus, he wanted to know the power of his resurrection. Now, number six is he's going to want to attain to the resurrection. But number four is he wants to know the power of the resurrection. What does that mean? What does it mean to you? To recognize the power of God is what she said. To recognize it and use it. Power here is dunamis. When you think of dunamis, you think of dynamite. How much power does dynamite have? Oh, it can blow up buildings. It can blow up countries if you use enough of it. It's powerful, very powerful. It changes things. Where do, how can we know the power of God, the power of the resurrection? Let's, let's stop there first. What does the power of the resurrection mean? What power is displayed there? To raise from the dead, to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And not only Jesus Christ, but it'll be us at some point and in, from being raised from the dead. How much power does that take? I mean, do you have that power? Does anybody have that power? Can anybody raise from the dead besides God? The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 32, I think, that it's God who gives life and God who takes life. He's the only one who can raise from the dead. Now, he can empower people to do it. He did it in the Bible. He empowered people to do it in the Bible. So his power can do that. But he's the only one that has that power. So if he's the only one that has that power, nobody else does. Well, that's really heavy-duty power. Can he use that same power in our lives? Can he empower us so that we have that kind of power to do miraculous things? For his purpose. For his glory and his purpose. She says he can do that. You never know when it's going to happen, any moment. Remember when Jesus said, you can, if you have faith, you have a mustard seed, you can move mountains? Well, who can move mountains? 
Nobody, unless we have the power of God. And if we have the power of God, ladies, we can move mountains. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us that power. Just think about it. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be, I don't know, overconfident or something here, but you think about the power of God. There is nothing God can't do. As a matter of fact, he says in the Bible over and over again, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. There's nothing that he can't do. So are you trusting him to do that? If you want to know the power of the resurrection, then you want to see the power of God at work in your life, in the world, in other people's lives. Do you think, do you believe that God can change our country? Turn us back around. Okay, what are you doing about it then? There's a lot we need to be doing. A prayer is the, the key a component. Because through prayer, we have direct access to the Almighty God. And while he doesn't change his character, he can change his mind. You and I have the power individually to be Christ-centered people to change our world. We have the power through our prayer and through God and the Holy Spirit to change our country. Our country has slid so far downhill. We just finished the book of Judges that spiraled and spiraled and spiraled downhill. Our country is down there as low as it can go. We are ready to be brought to judgment. But God can change that through the power of his resurrection, through his people. Do you believe it? Okay, are you going to do something about it? Yes. Okay, I hope so. And it's not just that. That's the immediate thing for, as a whole. But what about your life? What's the problem in your life? What's an issue in your life? I've seen him heal people. I've seen that were impossible healings. Linda over here, who's not here today, but who sits here in a wheelchair, had terminal cancer throughout her whole body. And um, now she's down to one a little itty bitty small thing in her pancreas. And that's it. I mean, God can do anything, ladies, for his glory. So what does he want to use you for? What do, what do you want God to be involved in in this world where he can be, receive the glory and he can use his power? Yeah, she said, just standing there in Lincoln. And, you know, cameras are going to be there. You know, the world looks at numbers. They, they will always take the craziest person in the crowd and interview them. So be careful. If, <laughs> if, if the news media comes to interview you, then you have to ask yourself what you look like. <laughs> because that's what they do on things that they don't agree with. But that could be it. I mean, it could be something. It could be running for office. I know people who have made a decision to run for office so that they can have a voice. And some have won and some haven't. But they stood, they stepped out, and they did something to make a difference in Christ and with his power. And by the way, winning isn't always the answer. I saw a friend recently who said to me, uh, that was, it was a lot of work, I just wish I had won, or something to that effect. You know, it, it was a lot of work and, and then tough to lose. But it's, it's all, if God leads us to do it, then he's going to teach us something in the loss, too. So it's never a waste of time. So I'm, I'm getting to political things, but let's look at spiritual things. How many people, how many people in your family are impossible to share the gospel with? <laughs> how many people in your family do you just dread scene at Christmas time or Thanksgiving or family reunions or something because they're so cantankerous and they cause you so much strife or, or they hurt you so bad. Does God have the power to change that person? Yes. Absolutely he does. I waited 17 years for my husband to start walking with the Lord. And I know women that have waited a lot longer than that. And some women have never seen that prayer answered. But trust me, God has the power to do it and he can do it through you. So that's his, that's his goal number four. Goal number five is that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings. Is that what you look forward to? <laughs> no. Why would anyone want to know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings? What does fellowship mean? Koinonia. That's right. Sharing in common. He wants to share in common the sufferings that Christ went through. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I don't look forward to those sufferings. The idea of suffering on a cross for something I didn't do, I don't like that. Now, if I'm suffering on a cross for something I did do, you know, I deserve it. But not for something I didn't do, but that's what Christ did. Did Paul live that life? Did he suffer for things that he didn't do wrong? Yes, yes. yes he did. 
Yes, he did. You know, we have this mentality in our country that we're just, it's, I have my rights. And because I have my rights, people can't abuse me and people can't uh, make me have a circumcision like they did your father, your husband. And, and you know, people can't, I, I don't deserve this. You know, I deserve to have the American life. But if we're going to have the fellowship of his suffering, Jesus never looked out for himself. He always looked out for others. And it caused him suffering. She's talking about three young people who were in uh, Lourdes, France, who saw the Virgin Mary in visions and how much suff suffering they went through afterwards. Uh, people do go through suffering when we want to know Jesus. It's not because God wants us to suffer. It's because Satan wants to destroy us, one. It's because God wants to perfect us and draw us closer to him so we'll give up ourselves and be drawn to him, which is a selfless heart and act. I love that. She says she recognizes, she thought about it, how uh, it, this means to her that God's going to be with her through her sufferings, that, that she may know that fellowship, that koinonia relationship with God. As she goes through sufferings, he's going to be there for her because he knows what it's like to suffer, yet without sin, the book of Hebrews says. Yeah, amen. She said she'd rather be with Christ in suffering than alone in the world. The final and sixth goal that he presented that we read last week is in Philippians 3.11, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, this is different. Before, he was looking to know the power of the resurrection. Now, he wants to attain to the resurrection. What does that mean? He wants to experience the resurrection. He's looking forward to that hope of the resurrection, which means he gets to be with Jesus. He's not putting his eyes on the sufferings or the problems of the world. He's wanting to attain to the resurrection of the de dead to be with Jesus. It was, he's, when he, when she, was, she was saying this, when Paul was raised to the third heaven that we learn about in Corinthians, I mean, he saw God. I mean, he was there in a vision in his heart. And boy, there's no more motivator than to see God even for a moment, and now he couldn't wait to attain to it. He couldn't wait to arrive at that time of resurrection. That's why he said in Philippians 1, to live is Christ, to die is gain. So he, he was looking forward to that time of resurrection. So now, this is what he's talked about now. Now we're going to move to the future. Oh, I didn't write that down. I must should have written. I meant to write that. Uh, for those of you who wrote that down, by the way, you've already got that on stuff that uh, I've given you. Uh, this, is, this is new because this is today, uh, what we're going to talk about today. And this is also Philippians 3, so that you can know when you see this, when it comes out in a picture form, you can know what we're talking about. Now Paul's going to move forward. He's talked about his past. He's been there. He's lived. He doesn't want to live it anymore. He wants to live following these goals, but he also has an eye towards the future. What he says in verse 12 now of Philippians 3, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I do what? Press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I kept going back and forth saying, he keeps saying the same thing over and over again here. What's he trying to say? But let's, let's take each phrase. He says, not that I have already obtained it. What's the it? Okay. In our English, we would assume that that's talking about this attaining the resurrection of the dead. Well, of course he hasn't attained it. He's not dead. So that's a little redundant. Until you look at the word it in the New American Standard that we have in front of us. What does it look like? It's in italics. Do you know what that means? It's not in the original language. So what Paul is saying, not that I have obtained these six goals. Not the it, not the thing immediately preceding it, which was this one. But the it's not in the original language. So he said, not that I've attained the goals that I've set forth. I haven't attained them yet. Not that I've obtained them. Not that I've already become perfect. What does perfect mean? 
In this context, this is a tough one because you really had to have some Greek tools to understand this. What? Holy? Usually it means holy, except that's the word hagios in the Greek is holy, and this isn't the word hagios. This is the word um, teleo, T-E-L-E-I-O-O. -O. Linda? Mature? Or complete. Um, or complete. Okay. The word in this part up here means complete. Not that I've been made complete. When we get down to verse 15, the word's a little different. It's T-E-L-E-I-O-S, and that means mature. So it's a little different. Let's focus on one at a time. Paul says, I haven't obtained these things. This is my present, my ongoing goal in life is to follow these six things. I haven't attained it. I haven't com become complete in following them. The only time I'm going to be complete is when? In heaven. That's the only time we become completely complete, is heaven. So I haven't, I haven't arrived. Have any of you arrived? No. I hope not. <laughs> because if you have, you're either dead or, or you're dead spiritually, if you think you've arrived. So one way or another, you're dead. So Paul says, I haven't gotten there, folks, but what? I press on. For the future, I'm going to continue to press on. What does press on mean? To pursue. To pursue. To pursue. What else did you say? Okay, swiftly, to seek after. In the original language, what it really means is stretching forward like a sprinter. So you can just imagine, you know, the sprinter coming up to the, what's it called, a ribbon? and how they stretch out like this to make sure they get over the ribbon. I got to thinking of, uh, because we're going there this fall, uh, well, we actually won't be in Marathon, but we're going to go in that direction. I got to thinking about the story of Marathon. How many of you are Marathon runners? Oh, we do? We have one in here. Good for you. How much discipline does that take? <laughs> Physical, mental, emotional. Everything, everything you do has to be wrapped around preparing for that, doesn't it? Yes. And then, prepare, once you've prepared for it, that's just preparing, then you have to run it. How long is a marathon? 26, 26. 26 plus, yeah, 26 plus miles. It's actually, um, according to Wikipedia, um, where'd it go? I had it written here, I'll find it. Okay, um, it is 42.195 kilometers, which is 26.21875 miles, or 26 miles and 385 yards. Why would you have a marathon that's that weird of a number? I mean, kilometers are point such, 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 and so are the miles. Why would you have that? Where does the name marathon come from? It comes from a city in Athens, Greece, right outside of Athens, Greece. I don't know if you know the story, but in the, uh, around 509 B.C., the Persians, if you recall from history, uh, the time of Esther, a little bit later, uh, the time of their going in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, the Persians became the world empire, Medes and the Persians. So they naturally went from east to west and tried to conquer Greece. Well, when they did, they had their first battle in a city called Marathon in 490 B.C., they went to Marathon. Now, what had happened the previous 20 years in Athens, or in Greece primarily, but in Athens, is that Athens had discovered this amazing form of government that they loved called democracy. What they realized that instead of being led by a king or being in a feudal system or having hierarchy of people, they could have a democracy where each one of them could use their gifts. They could have free enterprise. They could expand and study culture, which they did, and the Greek gods and all the things they did there in theater. They could expand in the political arena. But they had freedom to use their gifts to grow, and they liked it, and it was working. But if they lost to the Persians, what would happen then is they'd be under a kingship again. They'd be under another, another government. They wouldn't have freedom. So they fought and fought and fought at the Battle of Marathon. And they won. Miraculously, because the Persian government and the Persian um, 
uh, uh, army was so strong, it was impossible to do. But they were determined they were not going to lose this democratic system that they had. And they fought ferociously for it, and they won. When the victory was over, one of the army people ran to Athens to tell them. Now, you've you got to think about this. The, ar the battle didn't end at, uh, you know, at, at the first thing in the morning, so you got a good night's sleep the night before. This guy was in battle. When they won, he took off right after battle to go run to Athens to tell them. He shows up. His name was Philippides. He shows up in Athens, and he says, we were victorious. And he collapsed and died right there. Marathon to Athens, depending on the route you took, was just about 26 miles. That's why you have a marathon. That's why you have the amount of miles that you have in a marathon. But the key here is Philippides. Here's this man who so wanted to get the joyous news to Athens that after working so hard to save their country, he ran 26 miles. Can you imagine? You can imagine because you've done this. I'm not a runner. I don't understand this. But I can just think of the pain and the exhaustion and the thirst and everything that he went through, every block he ran, every mile he ran, how difficult he was. But he pressed on because of the prize. And the prize was to be able to let Athens know that they were victorious. They didn't have to worry about the Persians anymore. Well, they did. The Persians came back in the Battle of uh, Thermo Thermopylae uh, later, but they won then, and Persia never took over that Greek continent, that Greek peninsula, ever, because of the fighting of the people. But here's this man who continued to press on to the point of death because he was looking at his goal, and he wasn't going to give up until he attained it. That's what we see in Paul. When Paul says in, um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, in verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, that's like Philippides, pressing on for that goal of being able to land in Athens and tell them that they were victorious. And he gave his life to do that because it was that important. That's what Paul's saying here. I'm pressing on. I am going to continue to sprint. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to stretch forward all of my life from this point, from this point of setting my goals forward. I am going to stretch and I'm going to run for Christ. You feel that way? It's always, I love watching you guys. You don't know what you're telling me, but I'm a, I'm a body language person, so I really love watching my audiences. We say, yeah, we're pressing on for Christ. We say he's our Lord. We say he's number one in our lives. But is he really? I mean, I get tired. Do you get tired? You know, I'm older. I don't, the idea of retirement's kind of fun now. I never thought it would be, but, you know, it's kind of fun. In the, between Tuesday night and Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock today, um, I will have taught four times, three, an hour and a half each. And it takes me an average of about three hours to prepare for every hour of teaching. So that's 16 hours, well, three times, eh, four times, but I can't even do my math, I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's like 24 hours of prep and teaching in two days, in 24 hours, in 48 hours. That's a lot. And that doesn't include all the other things I'm doing and the radio shows and all the other stuff. Got a lot going on. Sometimes I get tired. Sometimes I just say, uh, I want to step back. And then I remember verses like this. And I remember my God. And I remember the calling on my life. And I remember, I can't stop. Because your eternal destiny might, may, might be on the line. Or yours. Or your spouse's. Or a friend's. Or somebody that's going to hear the gospel message from something that God has me doing and their life will be lost if I quit. How many lives will be lost spiritually if you stop or if you don't press on, if you don't continue 
to go in the direction God has told you to go. Now, I don't mean you become a workaholic or, or you just go out and do things to do them. You have to know what God's leading you to do, and you have to be going in the direction he's calling you to go. Otherwise, you're just doing it by the flesh. But when God shows you to do something, evangelism, he's put a heart of evangelism on Kathy, and she is doing everything she can to know about, to learn about, to pray about it, to be involved in it, to get others involved. That's her heart right now. Well, you didn't have that a year ago, did you? year and a half. So, you know, that's where God has put on her now, but she didn't have it before. So God, just ask God to show you what he wants you to do. This is what I love. Let, let's continue this because it's not your responsibility. It's God's. This is so much fun. Let's continue on. Verse 12, I'm going to finish up. Paul says, I press on so that I may lay hold, I may seize, I may have this oneness of possession of that which also I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. So he's saying, I press on because I've got to. Jesus told me to do it. He gave me the passion. He gave me the ministry. I have to do it. I'm compelled to do it. That's what Paul's saying here. Are you compelled to do it? And, and by the way, it's, <laughs> your ministry isn't necessarily going to be standing up teaching a group of people. It could be serving in the kitchen in your kid's school. It could be doing janitorial work for the church. It could be any of a number of things. It's not necessarily glamorous or what you think of glamour. Some of you think, well, I want to be up there on the stage singing, or I want to be up there doing this, or I want to be seen. Our work for Jesus is not to be seen. It's to be doing what he calls us to do, wherever it is he calls us to. One thing I know for sure is he will put a joy in your heart and a desire to do it when he gives you that heart to do it. And that's what Paul was doing. He had a passion to share the gospel with the Gentiles. And that's what Christ had given him. Verse 13, now, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. So he kind of goes, I'm not here yet, but I press on. But I'm not here yet, but I'm going to press on, is what he's saying. I haven't laid hold of it yet. Verse 13, but one thing I do. And what's that? Right, he actually gives two things. <laughs> Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Now, in Paul's case, he says, I'm forgetting the past. I'm forgetting who I was, the pedigree, where I came from, and I'm pressing on to go in this direction with Jesus Christ. So she says two things. That this uh, forgetting what lies behind deals with pre-salvation, but it also deals with our walk with Christ earlier in our lives. I mean, um, how many of us live in the past? I mean, I've got to tell you, I mean, when you hear somebody give an example, well, one example isn't going to do it, but when you consistently hear a pastor giving examples of things that happened 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 40 years ago or even 10 years ago, I want to say, excuse me, but what's happening today? I want to hear what God's doing in your life today and how you're ministering today. Now, obviously, I've got lots of great examples of the past that I use all the time because they were so life-changing. But if I stand up here and don't give you current examples of what's going on in my life, you've got to ask me, am I pressing on? Or am I living in the past accomplishments or past things that God has done? I mean, if the Jews lived on the parting of the Red Sea and that was it, I mean, they'd be pretty uh, struggling in life if that's the only thing they had to hang on to instead of the continuous things that God was doing. Okay, she talked about failures. Peter being one where he denied Christ three times. We have more counselors in our world today than we've ever had before. I meant to bring the numbers and I forgot, so don't quote me on this, but it, when I last looked them up, it was something like we have double, triple the counselors we had 30 years ago. Oh, no, that's not even true. I mean, it's even worse than, no, I say worse. It's much more than that. Because what we're doing is we have problems and we go to counselors and some counselors, not all counselors, will spend your whole time looking at your past so you can figure out who to blame on. And what happens is you get mad at people from your past or you stay in that hurt because you stay focused on the past. If you have issues, and we all have issues, but if you have issues where you need counseling, you go to Christ's community and you go to Theophostic prayer ministries there. Because what they do is they help you through prayer deal, dredge up the past so that you can get rid of those lies that, are, that Satan's feeding you from the past 
and you can leave them there and move forward. You don't keep going back week after week after week after week and hearing the same thing. You go for a positive thing that will get you to forget the past. I mean, if you've been abused, if you've been raped, if you've been sexually abused or abused by your family, if your father left you when you were younger or in your home and you grew up in a single home that was very difficult for you, if you were poor and you didn't have enough food and, and that now you're a hoarder because you just can't get enough. I mean, we have so much baggage in our past. We all do. But folks, we got to leave it in the past. If it's sin, we need to confess it. If it's something that people have done to us, we need to forgive them. And I don't mean, you know, oh, okay, I remember that they hurt me. I'm going to forgive them right now and walk ahead. You know, that takes healing. It doesn't just happen because you say it's going to happen. You've got to walk through the process. But walk through it and move on. Don't live in the past. I know people that were very successful, and then they lost their jobs, and they're not successful now. And when you talk to them, everything is about 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. Everything. Uh, and it shouldn't be. I mean, if you were president of a company and today you're the janitor, you should be relishing in the position that God has given you today and why he has you there and what you're going to do for the kingdom of God. It's all a matter of perspective. Instead of talking about, well, when I was back here, I used to do this. We used to give all this money to so-and-so. And we, you know, uh -uh. we've got to forget the past, folks. Whether it's be before Christ, whether it's the mistakes that we've made, or whether it's even our Christian walk where we became complacent living there, and we need to press on. Right. People did remember what he had done. So his problem was he came back to Jerusalem or would see Jews and they wouldn't trust him. Even Ananias, who was the one that God used when he got saved, when Paul got saved, didn't want to be the one to, because he knew of his past. Yeah. She says, instead of going to God, because times aren't the same, they, instead of going to God, they dwell in the past. Now I ran into, we ran into a, a server, a waiter at, at a, one of the restaurants. So we got talking to him. Uh, he was a very intelligent guy, and I wanted to know more about him. Turns out he's a counselor who got his degree in another state and has moved here because his mom's sick, but he has to wait for his degree, so he's working to make money while he's waiting for his, his whatever, papers. Yes, thank you. Um, but uh, what's interesting is I said, what kind of counselor are you? And he said, oh, drug and alcohol and other different things like that. So I said, did you do drugs and alcohol when you were younger? And he said, yes. And see, that man has taken his past and he's pressing on using his past to move on into the future. That was his issue. He's not living in it. He's not dwelling in it. He's using it to move on and help others. Just as 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says that we comfort those with the comfort which we've received from God. And that's what he's doing. So we can use our past. We don't need to completely forget our past, but we can't let our past drag us down. Or we can't live in the past. We just have to be, we have to give it up. We have a, a gal in the class, um, and I know I'm not giving up a confidence here, but we have a particular gal in the class that I was talking to, so if I haven't talked to you, you know it's not you, um, that was really dealing with some major issues that she came to me about a few weeks ago. And so I sent her some material on just dealing with forgiveness. Because in the discussions here, she said, I, I'm just hanging on to this unforgiveness and it's killing me. We have to give it up. I've got some material that I use. So Debbie Blank at AOL.com, if you can use it, just write me if you can do it. But the point is, I, we want to help you. Everybody, Christ wants you to get it, forget the past. He wants you instead to use it, remember it. Let it build your character, but press on for Christ. Yeah, she's talking about forgiveness and doing unto others. Well, whatever your issue is, if you still are hanging on to it, get help to get rid of it. But get godly help so that you can get rid of it. Because we need to forget what lies behind, and we need to then reach forward. We can't reach forward until we deal with the past. So then reach forward to what lies ahead. He says in verse 14 again, I press on towards the goal. What's the goal? What's the prize? What's he pressing on for? Is he pressing on for these six goals or is it something else? Eternal life. Eternal life. Christ likeness here and eternal life later. He's pressing on towards that prize of eternity with Christ. But life with Christ now, Christ likeness and life with Christ later. Both. As long as we're on this earth, we have to remain Christ-like. But the ultimate prize 
is eternity with Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That is our ultimate hope in this life, is being with him for all eternity. And there's only one way we can do that. What is it? Faith. We talked last week. It's not by rituals like baptism or circumcision, according to Romans 4. It's not by the law, because the law was given to show us right and wrong until Christ could come, according to Romans 4 and Galatians 3. And it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Those don't save us. Those are after effects of our relationship with Christ, but works don't save us. Uh, it is by grace that we are saved through faith, not as a result of works that no man should boast. That's a paraphrase of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. The upward call of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus, is eternity with him, the hope of salvation that comes for those of us who knew Jesus. That's his ultimate goal. Now, how's he gonna, how's he gonna press on? What's he going to do in the future to press on to meet his present goals? And he gives us five things. In verse 15, he says, let us, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, what are we, those of us who are perfect are supposed to what? Okay, have this attitude. So the first thing we need to do is understand perfect. And here, it's a little different word, as I mentioned, in the Greek. And the thing I love about Greek is such a precise language that every word or difference in a word has a little different meaning. And here it means mature. It doesn't mean perfect completion that I, you know, I'm in heaven because I'm perfectly complete. It means perfect or maturity. You're, you've moved or are moving to being mature. So how am I going to press on? I'm going to be mature in my walk with Christ. This is T-E-L-E-I-O-S. And the one in verse 12 for perfect was T-E-L-E-I-O-O. -O. Same root words, but different endings, so they mean something a little different. So how are we going to press on? We need to be mature. I don't mean in age. I mean in Christianity, in our walk. I mean, I... I will tell you, I'm mature. I may be a Christian for 42 years. If I'm not mature after 42 years in Christian, in walking with Christ, something's wrong. But I have, I have pressed on. I'm not perfect, but I have pressed on. And I, can, I am mature, but I'm not as mature as I'm going to be tomorrow or next week or next year, as long as the Lord tarries or as long as I'm here. My goal, how am I going to press on, is to grow in maturity with Christ. And then to have this attitude. We talked over in chapter 2 about having this attitude in ourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. But here it just says, have this attitude. What attitude? It doesn't go on to tell us what the attitude is. What attitude is he talking about here? What's the context? What would be the attitude that he would be discussing in this context? Okay. Okay. The goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus. So if we've got this attitude, the attitude is Christ-likeness. The attitude is going to be, just for lack of a better way of saying it, all of those goals are to point him to Christ, that he might know Christ. And so his attitude is to continue to press on to be more Christ-like. Okay? Now, if you're willing to really meditate on this and think about it, God will change you, your heart and your processes. Because I find that I get, yeah, you know, because I live in America, I get the attitude once in a while that I don't deserve this, whatever this might be. And then it just gets this little, you know, I have my rights and I don't deserve this. It just sits on my shoulder. And I remember that until I remember I'm supposed to have a Christ like attitude. And then I have to go, hm, hm, get off. You don't have any place in me because I have no rights in Christ. I am totally his servant. It's not about me. Then he says at the end of this verse, he says, have this attitude. And if any of you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. What's he saying here? It reveal means to unveil. God will unveil it to you. Uh -huh. God will convict you if you're not going in the right direction. It's God's responsibility. Now, it's our responsibility. We have to 
continue to press on. This is a, a forward moving verb. We need to continue to press on. As we're doing that, if we're going in the wrong direction, God's going to show us. Now, last night, God always has a way of giving me practical ac- applications. Last night, both my husband and I worked late, and we finally at about 9.30, we sat down and turned on TV for a little while, and, and he said, uh, well, just, he said, uh, I think we'll go down to Kansas City on Friday. And I said, oh, well, I'm busy on Friday until 5 o'clock. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> now, until this morning. <laughs> but he brought it back up. Now, that was, that was the end of the conversation. Now, you want to know what I was thinking? <laughs> what I was thinking is, I've been talking to him for weeks about wanting to go on just a little short cruise for a couple of days or you know, five days or something, just in May or June or July, just to get away before the a hectic, you know, get some time off. I've been talking to him about the idea of doing a few other things. And every time I bring it up, he goes, uh-huh. And that's the end of it. So what my first thought when he said this was, what about the things I've been talking about that I want to do? And now you're saying we're just going to go to Kansas City for a day on the weekend and you haven't talked to me about it? That's, that was my attitude. I told you I have attitude problems once in a while. <laughs> now, now he had no clue that I thought that. But that's what was going on in my mind until I remembered this verse. And until I realized that God revealed to me how blessed I am to have a husband who wants to go to Kansas City with me. How blessed I am that he wants to get away with me for a day or a day and a half. How blessed I am that we have the time. And he knew it because he'd asked me a few days ago what I was doing this weekend. How, when I started looking at the right things instead of me and what I had been talking about and what I thought I deserved and what I thought I was right, But when I started having the Christ-like attitude of looking at God and my husband in the right way, my attitude completely changed. You see, that's what God will do to us if we're willing to listen to God. Now, I could have heard God say that, and I could have gone, yeah, but it's not fair. I want to go on this other thing, and he knows that. We have to be willing to listen to God when he convicts us because if we love him and if we're pressing on, he will convict us. But we have to listen, and we have to obey, and we have to stop right then. I mean, I'm telling you that my thought processes didn't last a minute before God came in and convicted me. And I was so grateful he did, because otherwise I would have gone to sleep wallowing in that irritation of something that I wanted versus what he had thought of. Be careful, ladies. Have this attitude of Christlikeness. When God convicts us, and it's his responsibility to do it, make sure you listen to him. Verse 16, however, he says that we need to do what? Let us keep living by the same standard. What does that mean? What standard? Christ standard. Christ standard. Looking for Christ, knowing Christ, knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. We need to walk the line according to the standard that God has set for us. And each one of us has a different standard. You know, each one of us is at a different level of maturity. I've been a Christian for 42 years. Some of you may have been a Christian for 5 or 10, and you may be more mature than me. And maturity isn't in age necessarily. It's in our walk. So we have to follow or keep living, keep walking the line of that maturity. And then he says in verse 17, what are we to do? Join in following my example. Well, that's pretty arrogant, isn't it? No, why not? Because his, was that you, Carol? Okay. Yeah, his desire was to please the Lord. It wasn't about him. It was about God. And he had set the example. He'd spent all this time with these people. He has written them a letter. He set the example of who he is in his Christ walk. Now, I I don't know what Paul looked like. I don't know if uh, he had physical deformities or speech deformities. I don't know, you know, I really don't know what he looked like. So, but he's not saying that. He's saying, follow my example in Christ, in what I've shown you, in what I've told you, and in how I'm living. Yeah, good point. She says it's his faith. 
Not as much the examples as his faith. If he has faith, everything else will fall in line. If he lives out his faith, everything will fall in line. And by the way, it's not just about Paul. Who else is it about in verse 17? Others. Also, they are to observe those who walk according to the pattern. Who might he be thinking of here? Timothy. Timothy. Why? Okay, because Timothy... He talked about Timothy earlier. Who else did he talk about? Epaphroditus. Both of them are mentioned here in this book. Both of them were commended by Paul. So he's saying, don't just follow my faith. Follow the faith of these other people that you know, that you've seen, that have lived with you. Epaphroditus is from Philippi, it's believed. Follow them. Do you, can you say to somebody... Follow me. Now, I, I'm just the opposite. I say, don't follow me. Follow Jesus. Follow what he says, because I make mistakes all the time. But I will say to you, follow my faith. That I'll say to you, because I love Jesus. I have never not loved Jesus since the day I received him 42 years ago. And my love has grown and grown and grown to know him more, to, to desire him more, to be with him more. And my faith in Jesus is just as strong, stronger than it's ever been. And it keeps growing. So I will say, follow my faith, because when you do, you will have complete joy in following the Lord. Because everything's about him. Well, normally everything's about him. That attitude comes in. But generally speaking, things are about the Lord. How do we press on? These are five ways that he gives us on how to press on. Well, unfortunately, when you have a good example, as we have here, following his example and following the example of perhaps Timothy and Epaphroditus, unfortunately, verse 18 and 19, there's always going to be bad examples too. And he says, many walk, of whom I often told you, and I now tell you even weeping, that they are what? Enemies, Enemies of the cross. So what does that mean? Are they believers who've turned away from the truth? Are they believers who are skewing the truth with falsehood? Or are they unbelievers? All three. Yeah, it could be any or all three. Because Paul could weep for any of them. He had a heart for the lost. He certainly had a heart for those who, were, who had walked away from the Lord. Uh, so it, this could be for any of them. It could be the Judaizers that we talked about that tried to take the truth of the gospel and put the law into it. It could be the antinomians, which was another group of people who believe that as a, now that you're a believer, you can do whatever you want. There is no law. You can just have at it. It could be the unbelievers. It could be the Gnostics who are bringing knowledge in instead of faith in order to be saved. It could be anybody. We know that previously he had talked about in chapter 3, Verse 2, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of false circumcision. He also talked about opposition in chapter 1. We're always going to have opposition. The difference is knowing the truth versus the false. That's the difference. And how do you know the truth versus the false? You've got to know the truth well. You have to know what the Word of God says. Because... The false prophets and the false teachers will come in and you will think they know what they're talking about. They will manipulate you. They will shame you. They will uh, expound with all of their knowledge. But that doesn't mean they're right. Yeah, she said sometimes she's been floored by people who, because their life didn't match up with what they were teaching. We used, to, 30 years ago, my husband and I and our kids used to go to an evening Bible study with a great, great group of people and a fabulous teacher. Um, all I can say, it was a complete abomination, and we didn't know it. Teaching was great, but the lifestyle was horrendous, the things they were doing. Um, there was a national ministry that we've been to conferences for that turns out to be um, under scrutiny right now. It's um, being sued by numerous people for sexual escapades, among other things. And this is a national ministry that I still think the materials are about the best there is. We really have to be careful. 
because these I'm uh, uh, truth is important to me and both the local ministry and the national ministry truth was there still is but the actions didn't the leaders and the actions didn't live up to that truth they have to be careful she talks about religions that believe in Jesus but as a prophet but not as the true messiah we have to be careful it says here that they have a consequence verse 19 their end is destruction whose god is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame who set their minds on earthly things. The Bible tells us in uh, Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. We have to make sure. It, last night when my husband did that, my mind immediately went to the things of the earth. But God got a hold of me and convicted me, and they went right back to where they need to be. So no matter how mature we are in Christ, we can still get our eyes focused in the wrong direction. We have to instead look in the other direction. It's our choice. I mean, we can, we can live with our foot in the world, looking at the world, or we can keep our mind on the things above. Next week, we're going to study that, Philippians 4, 8, and uh, we're probably going to be looking up the definitions for all those words, but one thing I noticed about that verse, in Philippians 4, 8, uh, we're, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, there's no negative in there. We're not to be looking for the negative stuff. It's only the positive. It's, re it's always easy to see the negative. But that's next week's lesson. We'll get to that. The last two verses here. For our, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. What That word citizenship, it, it's great. What it means is it's, a, uh, it's like a capital city, and our names are written in the registry of that capital city. So we are secure as a citizen or as a member of that city. So our citizenship is in heaven. Well, wait a minute, I'm not in heaven, I'm here. But that's my hope. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for whom? A Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Patiently, eagerly wait means patiently, but with great expectation. And I believe Paul was probably talking here about the rapture, about the rapture of the church perhaps coming. He was waiting for that, but if that didn't come, then death would come and he'd go see Jesus. I think Paul, once he started preaching on the rapture, was looking for that rapture 2,000 years ago. And you and I could be living in the times today when it might take place. We are so close to Jesus' return. So Paul's goal, eagerly waiting, verse 21, Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of my humble mortal state into conformity with his immortal body of his glory. Now, we can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, about the difference of our mortal bodies versus our spiritual bodies, our temporal bodies versus our eternal bodies. By the exertion of that power, the power of his resurrection, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject or subdue all things to himself. Whoa, that's a new power we hadn't seen, that he can subject all things to himself. I think what Paul is saying here in this chapter is, I have no more have confidence in the flesh. Now, Paul's not perfect. He probably made mistakes, so we don't really see them in Scripture. But he's a sinner, so he probably did. But he forgot what laid behind from the moment he became a believer. He gave up that prestigious background. And instead, he set goals all his life that he worked on so that he might know Christ. And he didn't just continuously ongoing work on them. He sprinted, he strove, he pressed on to make sure that he would receive the upward prize of the calling of Jesus Christ. And I believe that what he was striving for here is the prize in verses 20 and 21, which is the being, having the citizenship in heaven and eagerly awaiting for the Savior, Jesus Christ. That was his prize. That's his promise to us and his prize for us when we walk with the Lord. I mean, what greater opportunity is it here? That we live in a wonderful world. We've had more opportunities in our world than anybody could ever have imagined in all of eternity. And in, in all of world history, I guess I should say, not eternity. I mean, life is really easy in the United States. And as easy as it is, we still have problems. 
we still get old, we still get sick, we still die. There's, even with everything as great as it is, there's no hope in this world. There's only one hope, and that's in Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's saying. His whole life, past, present, and future, is working not to work to get to heaven, but working because he loves Jesus, and he wants to grow in Jesus. You'll understand, these aren't going out and doing works. He's not saying, my goal is to build 15 churches. My goal is to baptize 100 people. These are all Christ-centered goals so that he can press on in his future. That's what he wants for us. I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, when a survey was done of pastors, of mega churches, as to the five things that show them what a successful church is, what did they say? Did they say the people may gain Christ? No. The people will, be, uh, that will have X number of salvations, uh, that will know the power of his resurrection, that will suffer for Christ? Did they say those goals that Paul had? No. They said size of the church, amount of giving, number of pastors, si uh, uh, number of pastors. Um, what are some of the other things? Programs, programs number of programs. I forget what the last one is, but all five of them had to do with numbers that had nothing to do with Christ. Now, I understand you can tell how a church is growing based on numbers, but I would think you'd look at numbers of salvations or baptisms, not numbers of attendance and that kind of thing. The focus is all on the world. We need to get our focus off the world and put it on Jesus Christ and his goals because that's what's going to be measured when we get the ultimate prize is our relationship with Christ. Let's pray. Father, God, how, what an amazing example Paul is to us from his life throughout the scriptures, but also from the words that he says that encourage us, lead us, exhort us to give up the past, whether it's pre-Christ days, whether it's mistakes, whether it's life that's caused us turmoil, give that up. Leave it behind. Shut the door on it so that we can live faithfully with goals that are Christ-centered goals. Because if we're mature with Christ, he will lead us. He will guide us. We don't have to set goals to do worldly things. He'll guide us in those goals. And then we know we can press on towards that maturity of fulfilling those goals to be closer to Jesus Christ, to be more Christ-like. God, that's my goal in life. And I want to hear you. You say here that you will convict us. You will show us if, we're don't, if we don't have this attitude, if we're not going in this way. So I ask you, just as you did last night when you showed me, I ask you to show each one of us in this room, if we are not having that attitude, if we have not pressed on and made you first in our lives, if you aren't the number one in our goals, if we don't have a relationship with you or we're not sure if we do, I pray, God, that you will convict us, that we will ask forgiveness, that we will come to know Jesus if we don't already, and then we will press on. For every breath that you give us, we will press on toward the goal of the upward prize, which is in Christ Jesus. And it is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, that we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.